Hello, students. Welcome back to Mr. Lahan's AP European History class. Today, we're going to do essential question 8.3. What were the characteristics of African slavery in the New World empires? Now, if you've been with us the last couple of essential questions we've been talking about, colonial empires of Spain and England and France, and kind of what those empires were like, where they were, how they developed, and we also yesterday talked about how they controlled, especially the Spanish, how they controlled their empires. Well, today we're going to talk about something that was um, everywhere in every colony, and that's African slavery. So pause if you need to, and let's talk about the characteristics of African slavery in the New World empires. Okay, so we've already talked about this a little bit in other notes. We talked about the Middle Passage, and in class, uh, we've also talked about the Middle Passage. So what we're going to talk about today is life after the Middle Passage and kind of life before the Middle Passage. Okay, what happened? How did this slave trade develop? All right, well, when Europeans first arrived in the New World, if you recall back in chapter, I think it was two, we talked about Bartolome de las Casas, right? And if you remember, De Las Casas, one of the things he wrote about in his work, The Destruction of the Indies, was he talked about the exploitation of Native American labor. So when Europeans first arrived, the first people that Europeans used as slave labor were Native Americans. And we talked about what De Las Casas said was going on, all the brutality. I mean, uh, oh my goodness, guys, where to begin? They were talking about the massacres that happened, the um, the disease that wiped out Native Americans. But bottom line, it was brutal. And after a while, because so many Native Americans were dying, Europeans tried to get the idea of what can we do besides Native American labor. And remember, one of De Las Casas' arguments that he later regretted was he argued that Native Americans are not immune to European diseases, which has caused them to die. So he argued for using African slaves, which were more immune to European diseases. Now, like I said, later on, De Las Casas regretted ever making that remark because he saw what happened to, Af uh, to Amer or African slaves and how brutal it was, just like Native American slavery. So when disease killed natives, Europeans turned to Africans. Now, remember, we've talked about this in class. We talked about it a little yesterday when we read King Nzinga, the king of the Congo area on the west coast of Africa, not the present-day Congo, but the kingdom of the Congo on the western coast of Africa. We read his letter, and we talked about how slavery in Africa kind of got established. And we talked about how when Europeans arrived, Africans, because of the Muslim empire and because of their own kingdoms, already had this internal network where they traded slaves all around the Mediterranean Sea. And one of the things that would happen is African kingdoms would conquer rivals. And the oldest form of slavery, guys, that goes back to, we're talking the oldest civilizations where you conquer a people, you enslave them. And that's what kingdoms in Africa were doing. And that's what the uh, Middle Eastern kingdoms had been doing. And even Europeans were engaging in this kind of trade. You conquer somebody, you enslave them. It all goes kind of back to the Crusades when Christians would fight Muslims, when they would beat the Muslim army, they would enslave the, the Muslims. And then when Muslims would defeat Christians, they would enslave the Christians. So the whole idea comes from conquering people and enslaving them. So when Europeans roll up to Africa, they've already got this extensive network of slavery. And what Europeans did, beginning with the Portuguese, is they got in on the action and they too wanted slaves from Africa. So like I said, through warfare with each other, African kingdoms just created this supply of slaves. And then when Europeans came in, they became the newest customer of these slaves that were acquired from these wars in the kingdom. And African kingdoms and African rulers, guys, were very much interested in goods that they could not get in Africa, European goods. I'll show you a map of some of these goods a little bit later on, but things like rum and firearm and textiles. Textiles, guys, are cloth, forms of cloth, like wool cloth, later on cotton cloth. All of these European goods are going to be traded into Africa in exchange for African slaves. And then, as you read, those African slaves will then be placed on the Middle Passage, and they will be brought to the Americas to be engaging in plantation slavery, at least those African people that survived the Middle Passage, because we've talked about the brutality of the Middle Passage itself. So yes, slaves were shipped across the Atlantic on the Middle Passage to work on plantations in the New World. 
Now, what was a plantation, just in case you don't recall from chapter two? A plantation is the idea, well, before plantations, individual farmers, like peasant farmers, they would grow crops kind of for their families, right? You grow crops, you harvest it. Sometimes you'd give some to the noble lord that the land that you were on belonged to, and then you would keep the rest for your family to either feed. And if you had enough, you might sell some of the crops and market. But later on, guys, um, because of slavery, what's going to happen is entrepreneurs, which are these guys that want to start their own business, get this idea of, you know what? I could grow lots and lots of cash crops like sugar or tobacco. And what I could do is I could use slave labor to grow those crops and I could sell tobacco and sugar and all of these products all over the empire and I could make a lot of money. And that's what a plantation is. Usually you have this huge, large uh, plot of land with slave labor. And the idea is you grow a huge cash crop to make a lot of money that you sell all over the empire. So most African people that survive the Middle Passage are going to go work on plantations. Although you do see, we talk about in my African American history class, a variety of different forms of slavery. Some slaves are going to work in early factories. Some African American slaves are going to work in people's houses as servants. So you see a little bit of a variety. But anyway, this is how you get this African presence in the Americas. So pause if you need to, and we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so contrary to what we might think, you know, a lot of people, when they think of the Middle Passage, they think that African uh, people were brought to the majority, the majority of slaves were brought to places like Virginia or the American South. But that's not true. The majority of African slaves were brought to two places. One of them was Brazil, owned by the Portuguese at the time. The other one is the West Indies, which we'll talk about here in a second. So the largest percent of African slaves were sent to Brazil and the West Indies, not to North America. Although later on, you're going to see a lot of African slaves are going to be shipped to North America, but always the majority are in South America and the West Indies. So what was in Brazil and the West Indies? What were these cash crops? Well, the biggest one was sugar. Now you might think, why was sugar such a big deal? Well, guys, think about the kind of food options available to most people, uh, coffee, tea, um, things like that. Well, guys, sugar makes it better, right? Sugar makes everything taste a lot better. Now, guys, of course, me, like a real person, I drink my coffee straight black, but some people are weird and they like to put sugar in it, all right, or all manner of weird things, guys. But anyway, bottom line is, guys, sugar makes things better, and sugar was in huge demand all over Europe. So anybody that owned a sugar plantation stood to make a lot of money. All right, so these sugar plantations were highly profitable because of this huge demand for sugar, but also coffee and also tobacco and other things that Europeans were in high demand for. Brazil, a Portug uh, Portuguese colony, grew a lot of different things. They grew sugar, they grew tobacco, they grew coffee, but they also engaged in gold mining. If you go back to chapter two, I showed you a picture that's been on a couple of AP European history tests, and it shows um, these slaves working in a mine, and it just looks absolutely crowded, cramped, brutal conditions, lots of death, guys, but that's kind of what slavery was. All right, so We'll talk about that here in a second. By 1725, though, most slaves were being brought to the West Indies. So the majority of slaves being shipped are going to switch from going from Brazil to the West Indies. And you might be where the West Indies, well, on a map at the bottom, guys, that shows the West Indies. Where are they on the larger map, guys? They're right here. All right, all of the tiny little islands south of Florida and north of South America in the Caribbean, okay, where a lot of piracy happens. So anyway... Sugar production here was intense, and guys, just the process of producing sugar was an intense process, not only in the growing of it, but in the manufacture of it. And a lot of African slaves are going to die each year due to a number of things, disease and the harsh labor conditions. So the idea that African people are not going to die of disease that people like De La Casas originally had doesn't really go over very well, okay? Because any time that you are brought to a place far away that you're not familiar with, you are not going to be immune to the diseases and also to the insects that carry the diseases that are going to be swarming around these hot humid areas. So sugar production was intense. And like I said, a lot of slaves died due to disease and just the brutal conditions of slavery. Now, this high mortality rate, the fact that slaves were constantly dying meant that guess what? 
You needed a constant influx of slaves from Africa into the New World. So because slaves were dying at such a high rate, they had a high mortality, which means a high death rate. That means you constantly needed more slaves. So Europeans were constantly showing up on the coast of Africa. And we learned in that letter from King Nzinga yesterday that their demand was so high and their demand was um, their demand was so high for slaves, and they were trading so many goods that pretty soon the slave trade got out of control. The kingdoms used to control the trade, but we remember from King Nzinga yesterday that King Nzinga's own nobles, King Nzinga was trying to stop the slave trade because it was depopulating Africa. So what happened was uh, European traders started to go behind King Nzinga's back and get his own nobles and give them European goods, and then they would go get more slaves. And it got to where, guys, literally kingdoms were just brutally killing and kidnapping each other in order to get these European goods, make money, and sell slaves to Europeans. So, like I told you yesterday, the demand for slaves in Europe is absolutely going to wreck Africa. And it's going to leave it weakened, so that in the 1800s, that is going to be the next target of imperialism. Pause if you need to. All right. Slavery and the transatlantic economy. So remember, guys, transatlantic, trans means across Atlantic, across the Atlantic economy from Europe and Africa to the Americas, transatlantic economy. So let's talk about this transatlantic economy. So although the Europeans, oh, excuse me, although the Spanish and the Portuguese, they're the ones that kind of initiated the, tra the slave trade, the Portuguese, probably around 1450, they were the ones that kind of initiated this trade uh, with African kingdoms. The Spanish are going to jump in later. And then guys, here come the Dutch. They're going to get in on the slave trade. Then the French. And then eventually, guys, the English are going to get in on the slave trade. All European nations are going to jump in on this. And like I said, it is going to absolutely wreck the population, the kingdoms, and the economy of Africa. By the 18th century, though, the chief, uh, the chief slave traders were the English. It switches from the Portuguese and the Spanish to the English. And we've seen this earlier on in another lesson, guys, in a different chapter. We talked about these religious wars between different nations. Primarily, one of them was England and Spain, right? A Catholic and a Protestant nation. And we talked about how in the late 1500s, the English defeated the large Spanish Armada, and that led to the kind of the beginning of the downfall of the Spanish Empire and the rise of the English Empire. And that's what's going on here. By the 18th century, the 1700s, the, Eng the English are the rising power, and they have been for about 150 years, and they became the chief traders of African slaves. Another thing that we've talked about way back in chapter two, I don't know why we talk about this in chapter two and not just wait for now, but it doesn't matter. But another thing that we talked about that had emerged by this time period is this idea called triangular trade. So this is pretty much, guys, the, the, the gist of transatlantic trade. All right. Now, the idea of triangular trade is that the trade across the Atlantic Ocean makes a triangle, as you can see on this map. All right. So what is triangular trade? Well, colonies, remember we talked about mercantilism, right? Colonies trade raw materials to Europe. All right. Like um, lumber and fur. And like you see on this map, whale oil, rice, silk, indigo, tobacco, sugar, molasses, wood, lumber, all that is traded to England or Europe. And what do Europeans do with this? Well, guys, they take all of those raw materials and they turn them into manufactured goods like guns and cloth and iron and rum. It says beer here, but rum would be the most likely idea that you would trade into Africa. And then finally, as I was saying, those raw materials, or excuse me, those manufactured goods are sold into Africa in exchange for slaves. And then those slaves are shipped to America to grow more and produce more raw materials, which is then shipped back to Europe to make more manufactured goods, which are shipped back to Africa to get more slaves, which are shipped back to America to make more raw materials, and round and round and, well, actually triangle and triangle and triangle it goes, and that is the triangular trade. And this is the pretty much the economy of Europe in the 17th century, triangular trade. So, 
All right, now, European demand for slaves, like I said, caused increases in African internal warfare and depopulated Africa. So because this trade is going on and the demand increased so much, like I said, the demand caused African kingdoms to go to war with each other, to conquer each other in order to get more slaves to sell to Europeans. So like I said on the last slide, European trade and demand for slaves is going to absolutely wreck Africa. All right. And like I said, that's going to lead to huge consequences later on down the road in other chapters. So remember that. Pause if you need to. The experience of slavery. Well, guys, I'm trying to think where to begin with this, guys, because nothing good can be said about the experience of slavery. We talk about this a lot in African American history. There's been throughout pretty much during right before the Civil War and after the Civil War, this movement to kind of make slavery sound, ah, maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought. And I always tell my African-American history students, no, guys, it was always as bad as we thought. OK, so the experience of slavery, guys, in no way, there's no way you could ever spin a positive light on slavery. Slaves, to begin with, had very little protection in the new world, if any protections at all. OK, uh, all laws, every law, even the old ones, guys, favored the owner of the slave over the slave itself. So any kind of slave protections, which were minimal, that might have existed, guys, it didn't matter because all laws favored the owner over the slave. Masters, guys, of slaves could legally, legally, guys, inflict harsh punishments on their slaves. Now, I will be honest with you, it is not in the best interest of a slave owner to inflict so harsh punishments that the person cannot work anymore. All right. So the murder of slaves happened, but it wasn't the rule. The uh, beating and whipping and, and brutalizing of slaves happened, all right? It happened pretty commonly. But like I said, uh, the idea of, you know, dismemberment of an arm or a leg or a hand or a foot or something like that, it did happen, but it wasn't the standard because, like I said, uh, the idea was you wanted the person to be able to keep working. But, guys, that doesn't mean that slavery wasn't brutal. There was not a slave, guys, that did not experience some form of punishment. As a matter of fact, the entire system of slavery was based on the threat of physical punishment. And in my Af African American history class, we, oh my goodness, guys, so, you know, guys, it just talk about so many, so many days we talk about just how awful and the horrible things that happened because of slavery. All right. Children of slaves were legally slaves. One of the things that we talk about in my African American history class is just this idea that slavery was often legally passed down through the mother. So if an African American woman had a uh, became pregnant, then her child would be born a slave. And the idea was uh, that always produced a steady stream of future slaves that would grow up right? They didn't pass it down through the father because oftentimes white masters would rape their African-American female slaves. And in order to avoid having any kind of responsibility for that child, once again, a lot of laws were passed that passed slavery down through the mother. So the child would be born a slave and then the white father that uh, of that child would have no legal responsibility to that child. So guys, like I said, there is no there's no way to paint slavery in any kind of positive light. And the reason I say that is if you're in my African-American history class, we talk about all the dumb arguments that people make throughout history to say, well, slavery was, it really wasn't that bad. Oh, yes, it was always that bad. OK, now, another thing that was part uh, one of the most horrible things about slavery, if you could talk about the most horrible things about slavery, was that a slave could be sold for any reason at any time. We'll talk about later on. Next year, guys, uh, slave auctions. Okay, slave auctions, guys, were, you know, a humiliating, terrifying thing. You would be brought into, uh, if you were in a rural area by the coast, you would be pretty much rounded up like cattle. And you would be sold at auctions where people would come to buy you and they would, uh, they would do these examinations on you. They would force open your mouth. They would look all over your body. If you're a woman, they would take you into a back room. 
to examine you and you can take that however you want to. Uh, but anyway, just the idea of a slave auction was a terrifying experience. But maybe the most terrifying thing of all is if you were an African family that was captured and enslaved together, when you were sold at auction, you might be sold away from your children and never see them again. Can you imagine? being separated from your children? Or can you imagine the terror the terror of a child be separated, being separated from their parents? And guys, that was a common reality. And it didn't just end with the slave auction. One of the other things about slavery, guys, is that a owner of a slave could at any time for any reason sell their slaves anywhere. So you might have been with a family. You might have had your family with the, you know, one particular owner for a long time. And then after 20 years or whatever, uh, they decide to separate you all and sell them for whatever reason. Maybe uh, the owner hit an economic downtime and they needed to make some quick money and they could sell uh, their slaves. So that's another thing about slavery is that slaves could be separated for any time and sold and families could be separated. Slave experienced harsh labor. Slave experienced poor diet, poor living conditions, guys. Um, you know, one, we talked about this in my African American history class. One of the arguments that Southerners that had in the in the 1800s in America was that owners give their slaves everything they need: free housing, free clothes, you know, free food. But guys, like I said, if you saw the clothes, they were usually one maybe two pairs of clothes a year, all right? So you can imagine how fast those worn out, and they were not replenished till the next year. Food, guys, was just enough to keep them going. And living conditions, some uh, some African slaves, guys, lived in shacks with their extended family in one room, kind of like the tenements we'll talk about later on and um, the industrial era. But the living conditions were poor, guys. Like I said, the, the labor was harsh and the diet was barely enough to get by. All right. So there's no idea that, you know what? Slaves should be happy because they get food and their master gives them clothes. And guys, stop. All right. You know, that's what I would say to those arguments. Just stop. All right. Now, African slaves often converted to some form of Christianity. One of the things that we'll see later on, guys, is that um, when African people come over to the United States, a lot of them are Muslim or a lot of them have their traditional African uh, spiritual beliefs. And when they come over, they convert to Christianity. And not only that, but they also infuse Christianity with their own indigenous, indigenous beliefs, and they create this new kind of hybrid form of Christianity. So anyway, the experience of slavery, guys, although we, one could say that it was varied, things that were common were, like I said, uh, lack of rights, lack of any protections, brutal treatment, um, family separation through auctions and selling. Uh, once again, guys, there's no way that anybody can paint slavery uh, in a positive light. Pause if you need to. All right. Now, the very last thing is European racial attitudes. Now, one of the things you're going to see in this class is you're going to see Europeans, and you've already kind of seen it, Europeans are beginning to develop what we will eventually call white supremacy. Now, slavery didn't start off based on race, okay? The, old of, the oldest forms of slavery that existed everywhere, guys, whether it was Native Americans conquering other Native American tribes that were rivals or Europeans conquering other Europeans that were rivals or the Romans conquering other surrounding people that were rivals or Asians conquering other Asians that were rivals. It wasn't about race. It was about, you are my enemy. I'm going to conquer you. I'm going to enslave you, okay? Uh, but very quickly... By the 1700s, it had become about race. Slavery had become white people conquering African people and enslaving them. It became, guys, white people enslaving African people. All right, Europeans enslaving African people. So the slave trade by the 1700s had very much transformed into a racially based system. All right. Native American slavery probably existed a little bit, but it was dying out. Other groups of slavery were dying out, guys. And the main dominant form of slavery was African slavery. And it didn't take long for Europeans to start to see themselves as superior to African people. I mean, think of it. If you are a white person in the Americas, and you are constantly around African slaves who are not given the chance to have an education, not given a chance to socially better themselves, you are going to see them as slaves and only slaves. 
Then you're going to even look at a free African person that lives in America that's never been a slave. And even though they may even have a better education than you, because you are surrounded by African slaves so much, you're going to start to associate that with superiority. You're going to start looking around saying, why am I better than this person? And that's what happens, guys. Europeans are going to start to see themselves better than the people that they enslave. Now, remember, guys, there is nothing inherently better about any ethnicity. It's all about opportunities. One of the things that you're going to see in African-American history, if you take that class next year, is you're going to see that when African-Americans are given the chance and the same opportunities as whites in this country, they are going to have Ex they're going to have the, you know, the, the same achievements as whites, if not more in some areas. Okay. So guys, it's all about opportunities, but Europeans at this time didn't.